I'm the Bunny Man. And I'm Crazy Susie. And we are in the Eyes of Terror. And we're coming back again with our February lineup of Bloody Bloody Not So Valentine. And tonight's movie is Blood Feast, 1963. Again, we saw this one on Tubby TV. And IMDb gives it a 5.1 out of 10. It is not rated, and it is 1 hour and 7 minutes long, and it is simply just, an, just a horror film. This movie has also been known as Egypt, Egyptian Blood Feast and Feast of Flesh. It was directed by Herschel Gordon Lewis. The godfather of gore. It was written by Allison Lewis Down. The cast is William Kerwin as Detective Pete Thornton. Mal Arnold as Fouad Ramsey. Connie Mason as Suzette Fremont. Lynn Bolton as Miss Dorothy Fremont. Scott H. Hall as Frank, the police captain. Chrissy Fossey as Trudy Sanders, and there are many more. You can find the full list on imdb.com. The estimated budget for this film is $24,500. It grossed in the United States $4 million, and the filming location was Florida. The storyline is an Egyptian caterer busies himself collecting body parts, from young maidens in order to bring Ishtar, an ancient goddess of good and evil, back to life. When he has prepared enough parts for the ceremony, he hypnotizes a woman giving an engagement party for her daughter at which he plans to perform the ancient rites of summons using the daughter as his final sacrifice. So, we're going to talk about the movie, not give a an over a general blow by blow of it. So, let's get started, I guess. We did something very similar when we talked about like what Hexon, Nosferatu, things like that. Mm -hmm. We do this when it's when relatively movies are hard to, or really boring to try to give exactly what happened throughout the film. Right. If we talked about what happened in the film, we would basically just be saying, and now he killed this person and he cut off this. And now he killed that person and he cut off this. And he cooked it up and he killed this person and he cut off this and he cooked it up. We would just be repeating ourselves mm -hmm. over and over again. That would get boring. It would be boring to listen to. It'd be boring for us to even say. <laughs> so this film was made in 1963. Mm -hmm. And this is really where gore was starting to... There's a lot of... A lot of people say this is the, the first gore film. I don't think it is, but I could be wrong. I, I felt like there's other ones prior to this. But this could be the, the original one. I'm not no film historian. So this was... It definitely was during a time period when... Films like this would be kind of taboo. Mm hmm It was like they were just starting. Like, Hammer was just coming into being. Right. I mean, this was the time where we started seeing film being pushed. Mm hmm Where we're getting away from, like, really innocent films to something that was a little bit more rough around the edges. Mm hmm But I think that had to deal with, like, Post World War Two, and then at this time we were involved in Vietnam, so it might have been like we were just getting tired. You know, we didn't want to live in a fairy tale world. We wanted the gore and stuff like that because you could turn tune in at that time and watch Vietnam on TV, hmm. and you were getting exposed to killing and stuff like that. So, so it, it might have been that's why it cha the lexicon changed on it. But like also, if you look back. In the 50s, the, the horror comic books before uh, the comic uh, the comic laws came into play were pretty gory also. So there's always been a want for gore. Mm -hmm. It was just um, getting there. 
So this one put it on the map. I imagine this place was play, played in like really seedy like drive throughs and stuff like that. I don't think it actually had a full release until probably VHS's, Betamax, whatever. I really don't know much about the history of this movie. Let's just talk about it in general. So what did you like about it? I liked um, the um, just that antique quality of you know the whole black and white film but the blood was so bloody yeah it was you know like the beginning of technicolor i guess right the film itself was that kind of you know it yeah. had that black and white feel that softness of black and white to it and the colors were they just seemed not really muted, but pretty bright. But when they got to the blood, like it's almost like they magnified the redness of the blood. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting myself. Although the blood now <laughs> nowadays doesn't look as realistic as it probably did back then. I don't know if they used real blood. No, no, I think they used house paint. Or thin down paint or what, but it is so red. Yeah. Yeah, the way that it would it spilled out onto like the flesh because he didn't mention that is like it looked really weird on skin, mm -hmm. and just like how thick it was, it, there was no thinness to it. It was just it just reminded me of still wet acrylic or house paint, mm -hmm. or just you added a little bit of water. So that's what I really think it was. It was just because you know at that time they, I mean, I mean I'm pretty sure they knew how to make blood, but. I mean, it would have been sort of expensive. Right. So, I mean, house paint is relatively cheap, and it has that effect, you know, of that brightness. That Right. I mean, the blood was just, like, immensely red and bright, and it was like, whoa, that's, that's eye-catching. I really like the Americana feel. Like, the, the you know, just how America used to be. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, just, the, just the old architecture, the way that the cars looked. Yeah. Even the clothing. It, yeah, they definitely give you this feel of, oh, this is a safe place to be, and then this dude's hacking up people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, <sighs> and every, uh, it's just, it was really interesting. It's just no one thought it was him. That was the really interesting part of it. And it was just, everybody was just like, how could this have happened in our safe community? Mm -hmm. So, I thought that was really interesting. Um I mean, it was just, there's that. And I think, you know, even the Egyptian stuff, as corny as it looks, it was still has its, uh, oh, that's cute moment. You know, like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you know what I'm trying to say? Like, mm -hmm. we look at it today and it, obviously it looks nothing like what we could produce today. Yeah. But rustic, I guess, is the best term. Right. I think I just found it very interesting because it's not, you don't find films that are so basic now. Films now have to have all these graphics in them, have to have all this. They have so much in them that they have so many details that you can't experience everything. Well, yeah. and things get lost. Yeah, and I think, you know, even like the, the intro, you know, like where it said Blood Feast. And it has, like, blood feet, like, painted out. Mm -hmm. And then they drip blood, paint blood on it, you know. And I think it literally what they did was put it on a piece of glass, you know, and film that and had the, you know, basically overlays. Mm -hmm. It was just a, it's a very cut and dry, basic shooting film. Right. But I think that's what gives this movie that timeless quality. Mm -hmm. Because it really has that timeless quality to it. It does, yeah. It's not bogged down by a whole bunch of technical crap and... Even the jacket does. And the jacket has that same essence of black and white with that red, that big punch of red where the red just like, wow, you know. I mean, it's... The jacket has that same thing. And then, it, you know, even the tagline, you know, in the annals of... With the annals of... Nothing as appalling as... And the annals of horror. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's trying to punch this idea 
And I think it did it really well because it does give that that backdrop of Americana simplicity with the horrors of what this guy's doing. Yeah. Although nowadays it's comical compared to what you know when when he opens up like the pi- the pizza oven and you can see the dry not chunks of dry ice but you know it's dry ice boiling over and it's not going and you can just tell that's what it is it's just dry ice it's just set in there there's no cgi fog or whatever mm-hmm. no additions not a whole bunch is just like literally a block of dry ice in there and it's pouring off of one side and that's it <laughs> you know just you know but it gets it gives that effect right it is its simplicity that gives it the charm though you don't see that anymore Maybe some indie films, but I mean, even this is just, I don't know. It was just. Yeah, but I don't think a lot of. Some indie films just aren't done as well. Mm-hmm. It was well, it was well thought out. So. And even how, like, the scenes were well thought out too. Like the first lady, he cuts her leg off. And they have her in the tub. So. They have like a bubble bath going, mm-hmm. and they have her le- around her leg. There are bubbles. Well, well, let's talk about that. In the sixties, they really did not understand the idea of sexy underwear at all. Granny panties was the way to go. Just playing something out. You're really deter- perturbed about the granny panties, aren't you? Just nothing sexy about them. What does that have to do with her leg getting butchered? I don't know. Just we we got a full scene of granny panty though. Well, the the panties in the bra weren't sexy. They were just mm. cotton. <laughs> cotton Hanes ish before Hanes. I don't think there was a before Hanes. I don't know. I don't know the history of Hanes Company. So they have her knee bent, and they had this bone looking thing look like it's protruding from her knee. Like it's a great big joint. I don't know if they attached it to her leg to where it looks like it's sticking up at her knee. But they did a very good job of making it look like, you know, her leg was cut off at the joint. And the joint is still there. Like he very delicately with this great big machete hacked into her leg, and then cut around the joint and removed the leg. Yeah, he, he knew what he was doing with that machete. He was a machete wielding butcher, I guess. Just Oh, yeah. And even then, they were trying to be... You could tell that they were trying to push decency laws. Because there are a hint of breasts within that scene. But they had to be covered with soap. Yeah. Her nips are covered up with the... Yeah, but you don't really see him take off the leg or anything, which is, you know, the, uh, I like, I like to call it the, um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre effect Mm -hmm. where Texas Chainsaw Massacre is not a very bloody movie at all. If you look at it as a movie, you never see blood, you never see blood. It's just, it's, you imagine it because of everything that's going on. You hear the noise and Mm -hmm. the screams and you see people being chased. So you... Your brain fills in the blood. This is sort of the opposite effect. You're, you're, you see the blood. You see the gore, but you don't see them him actually hacking it. So your brain fills it in. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that, I mean, it did it really well, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so. The one thing that really got me was when he ripped out that chick's tongue. I was like, what? Well, that, that was a whole, like, how does that work type thing. That's what we got. It was just. I mean, she's like, oh. And he's just sticking his two fingers in there and just. Basically, catfishing her without. Or not catfishing her, but, you know, hooking her mouth open with two fingers trying to tear out this tongue. Yeah. And he comes out with a handful of something that looks like a small loin loaf. (laughs) And she's got a mouthful of blood. I'm like. I don't think that's physically possible to rip out a tongue, but okay. Yeah. That was disturbing. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the killings in this movie were, you know, by just 
I guess the one thing it does is is Fouad is a very ferocious killer. Animalistic is the best way. You know, in the way that he kills it would be considered animalistic. He is methodical in certain points, but he's, you know, but like with the tongue thing, he just goes sort of ape crazy and rips out her tongue. How could you remove a tongue nicely? Buy it dinner first? I don't know. Give it a glass of wine. <laughs> Seduce the tongue to come out just a dish and just rip it out. <laughs> I don't think there's a good way to remove a tongue. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Cut it out maybe, but then you don't get it all. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. There isn't any good way, but I mean, the way, I mean, just the way. I mean, he got on top of her. It was just a brutal aspect, and I, even like okay. So I think it was really interesting in, in this movie was the camera angles. It, it gave that a very they weren't stationary camera angles. You know, they didn't show him on top of her doing this entire, entire thing. You know, they did give a perspective of her, uh, of him, like first person wise. It's almost like they gave it from his perspective. Yeah, but I mean, even the camera work is very unnerving. They gave the camera work a very unnerving feel by adding it... A little bit to the le to the right and off centered. The way that it was shot, it was just it wasn't straight on. It was off centered and stuff like that, and it gave that unnerving feeling to him when he is like when he's killing. You know what I found to be really strange? He goes through and kills all these people, and nobody witnesses anything. The cops finally catch up to him, and it takes. Four or five grown men cops to catch up to a crippled man. Half who's, crippled. Half who's crippled. Basically dragging his whole right leg. Yeah, that makes him a half cripple. This man that could elude an entire precinct of cops who is so smart that he can kill all these people climbs into the back of a garage. No, uh, no, not garage. Garbage truck willingly climbs into the back of a garbage truck to hide from the cops. He gets compacted in the back of a garbage truck. That was his undoing. Yeah. That was his demise. He gets compacted in the back of a garbage truck. And the cops line was something like, well, that's one way to take out the trash or something it's along some that. Some pokey line of, yep, well. Another day, another dollar. Um, I should have written that down. That was actually... <laughs> I'm sorry, here it is. He died a fitting end, just like the garbage he was. So, you know, like, the whole thing was based around, like, Egyptian lore. Ishtar and all that stuff. And he really fell in... He really loved it, that statue of Ishtar. Like, he would cook... And no one realized he was cooking weird stuff in the in the back of his shop. I'm assuming it was the back of his shop. Mm -hmm. You think people would be like, "What's that smell? It's unique." But I guess because he's Egyptian, it would be. He he wasn't an Egyptian shop. I thought it was. No, it was a shop of unusual. Let me see if I can find the name. Like Fouad Ramsey's. It was something about unusual foods or something. It didn't have a specific... The only thing that we really was got specific about was the name of his book. And it basically outlined what he was about to do to everybody. His book did? Yeah. It was, you know, remember it was like... Uh, how to create a blood feast for the goddess Ishtar. And the only reason why even the one detective... Because he... Found out about it because he went to a lecture about Egyptology. Mm -hmm. And the guy just conveniently brought it up. Yeah. But the whole concept of the film was very interesting. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, there being a little town and a guy owning a store, a catering business of, for unusual palettes. And... Do you think Floyd was the original Florida man? I don't know. Who knew? 
So, okay, so there's just that. Well, like, flawed, to me, I was, I was like, noticing through the entire film, the guy was very shiny. Did you notice that? Mm-hmm. Flawed was very shiny. Mm-hmm. And his, his um, eyebrows were very lacquered. His hair, too. His hair, too, yeah. I think that guy bathed in, like, floor polish before <laughs> he went in every day. Just scrub, 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 lacquer it on. <laughs> Gotta shine up my face. Maybe he wanted to emulate Ishtar. Yeah. He polished her and then he polished himself. <laughs> oh, Ishtar. I'm going to become a statue. I really don't remember a lot of the, about the music in this, do you? No. Which I think is good because I think a lot of like horror movies... The music takes over. It relies too heavily on music. You know what I'm trying to say? A lot of horror movies rely too heavily on music to give you that scare. I just, you know, I think this one would really, I thought, like I said, I thought it was really interesting was how uneasy the camera made you feel mm-hmm. when it came to certain things, such as the killings. and Yeah, when he was in her mouth digging out that tongue, it really got you in there to where you were like, Ugh. Yeah, and then, you know, even like sort of like the, de- you know, there would be, even like the colors work too. Because the colors, you know, were the plain sort of Jane type Americana colors, you know, that almost like slate gray with a bit of blue in it, mm-hmm. you know, that he was wearing and then his shop was sort of in and even the motel house, you know, but then you went back where he was cooking for Ishtar and it was a lot of golds and reds. Blues, blues, really deep blues, like marine blues. Mm-hmm. Very exotic colors, and I thought that was really interesting. That shift, mm-hmm. um, and I mean, even like the brutality, like towards the end, I think it was like his last victim. You know, he was whipping her, and it was just—it was a very brutal scene. I think I felt like it was very—he was. I mean, you could tell that it was blood on the the whip, but I really wondered if he was really getting into it or not, the character. Because he really seemed like he was really whipping her. It didn't look like it was a fake whip, you know. Mm -hmm. No, I think it was just rope, but... Right. And then... So, you want to talk about some of the goofs or whatever? The little things that we saw that just sort of were funny or... What was funny? Or, you know, just anything that sort of just took you out of it or... To me, it was like that, that ritual scene where the guy, the one guy, they were talking about, you know, the original Ishtar's feast or whatever. And he had this snake. Then they were talking about what the snake was about. And he stabs that one chick in the chest. And she's still breathing. Because he and, did a close-up. Of- and he moves the knife and there's no blade there. So you <laughs> see that it's a... The, just the hilt. It's one of those, like, collapsing blades. <laughs> yeah. And then he pulls the knife up, and then the blade's there, and it's all bloody, and she's still laying there with blood all over her chest, and she's still breathing. And she opens her eyes, and she closes them, then she opens them again, and she's just, like, staring blankly off like she's still dead, and she just doesn't care anymore, so she starts breathing normally, <laughs> and you're like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Are you even trying at that point? Um, so there was that scene. And then, like, the the tongue scene, like, the aftermath of that one sort of got to me. It was because you think that it would be, like, a broken jaw or something. You know? The funny thing is, hmm. one of the trivias are, Ishtar was actually an ancient Babylonian mythological goddess, not an Egyptian one. Well, I think the reason why they went with Egypt was because at this time, I think in America, Egyptology started to blow up. You got to think, like 10, 20 years ago. So why did they not choose an actual Egyptian goddess? Because no one knew or cared. Well, Lewis and Friedman actually knew that this was not an Egyptian goddess. I don't know. They probably just liked it just for the sheer, like, name of Ishtar. I mean, it is a pretty cool name. Ishtar. This is funny. Producer David F. Friedman came up with some very effective publicity stunts for Blood Feast. 
which included giving theatergoers vomit bags, reading, You may need this when you see Blood Feast, and obtaining an injunction against the film in Sarasota, Florida, which, of course, only generated more interest in the film. So, it sort of reminds me of um, William Castle stunts. On You know, like, William Castle, he, uh, and one of his, I think it was Shocker, not only did he put a, a thing, a Shocker, like a, a mechanism that would shock the the moviegoer, yeah. but he also had people sign uh, liability waivers. Mm-hmm. So if they would have a heart attack or whatever during the film, you know, the so shocking you have to sign a waiver thing. Yeah. And it sounds sort of like one of those publicity stunts. I wish movies would do that again. I really do. I would love to see, go to a theater they give me a barf bag or something like that. You know, just, I, I want to see the publicity stunts again. This was filmed in Miami in only nine days. You know. And cost less than twenty five thousand. And it earned back it earned back millions for its creator and associates. Yeah. Uh, like I said, this one put Herschel Gordon Lewis on the map. This made his you know, he did this, he did uh uh, uh 2000 Maniacs, he did several other great gore films. I mean, he made his career on gore films. He started his own ad agency at one point. Um, He was actually featured in Chainsaw Sally uh, as the manager of um, the hardware store. He was the operator of the hardware store. Yeah, there's a tie-in for our podcast. (laughs) Um, yeah. The actor originally cast as the police captain did not show up for the filming, and Scott H. Hall, a talker for the Ringling Brothers Sideshow, who had also worked for Billiard Brothers Circus in 48 and 49, with Blood Feast producer David H. Friedman stepped into the role. He'd originally been hired for the project in various other capacities. Oh, and we actually have this on physical copy, too. And I watched the trailer for it. The trailer was really interesting. Hmm. Like, the original trailer for this movie. Hmm. It had one of the... It had uh, the the police chief standing in front of, like, the screen. He was like, this is the most disturbing film you'll ever see. You know, and it just is like, and then they show clips of the movie, and I was like, it really, that trailer gives you that mindset of that horror. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've seen the trailer. They, I think they used part of the old trailer in the new remake, which kind of irritated me, but. Okay, so we didn't see the remake yet, but you want to talk about, briefly about the sequels, or spiritual sequels, or. It was included in Times Magazine list of the top 25 horror films of all times. Well, without this movie, we would not have Saw and Hostel and stuff like that. I honestly think, you know, this pioneered so many gore horror films. Kevin Thomas of the Los Angeles Times called it the grisliest, sickest picture he'd ever watched. At the time that it came out, I can see how it would be very disturbing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But nowadays, it's laughable. Right. Well, look at what we have. But then, there was nothing else like it. I think for true, I I, for true people who actually really enjoy horror, I think this is a really good movie to watch because it, you know, you can sort of, I guess, map things from here. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. So, this film has sequels. Mm -hmm. It has a sequel, All You Can Eat. That was done in 2002. And a remake. And it has a remake that was done in 2017. And it has a spiritual sequel. Which is what? Blood Diner. Blood Diner, which we have seen. We haven't seen All You Can Eat, have we? I think I've downloaded it. We We do like Blood Buffet. Mm-hmm. That one's a, is a great one. 
is a great film. And it's along the same lines, except for it has two brothers. No, no, no. Okay, so here's what happened. Blood, Blood Diner, the whole plot of Blood Diner was that during the chase scene, uh, Ramsey's, they were, he was their uncle, mm -hmm. the two kids. So he comes in and gives these medallions to these two boys during that whole, like, the, the cops were after him thing. And they're like, but continue my work before he gets, you know, killed. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's the tie-in. The issue is, the reason why it's not like Blood Feast 2, Blood Diner or whatever, is because they could not get the rights to the movie. Hmm. So they went ahead and filmed the movie, but changed up, the you know, the name of Ishtar... I think it's like Itar or something. You know, it's like Ashtar or something like that. And then it's a lot gorier. It's a lot. It's a lot more comedy. Yeah. Um. But it's a spiritual sequel to the movie, and it really works for that movie. It. You know, but I looked at the poster for the remake. I don't think that you should make should remake films a lot of times. No, I think it really. It ruins it. Well, I don't think you could recapture a lot of that feeling of the original. Of the original. The original, original. Of the original, original. Yeah, you can't. You can't re. It's like trying to catch you know lightning in a jar twice. Mm -hmm. It's never going to happen. Yeah, I think most of the time you just end up ruining it. Well, so I think a part of the like, the classy cheese, of this of the. Of the original movie was that the Egyptian stuff was corny. It you know it didn't look right. It was just this hokey mask that was done by a third grader somewhere. You know uh, the Ramsey mask. You know they didn't have a lot of Egyptian. The the statue was not. It looked like you got it from Pier One. Mm -hmm. It was just a really badly put together statue type thing carved in gold you know it's just it looked corny that type of stuff you know uh everything about it was corny but it was it worked for that type of movie and it made that movie interesting to me whereas updating the graphics and giving it a higher budget and giving it realism that takes something away from it, it. Yeah, it takes away that. It, you're not going to have that Americana. You, you, we've lost that safety. I think the great thing, I think the great thing about this movie, solely is, is the safe America, where everybody, you know, that that old adage that our grand or great grandparents used to tell us. I at one time I could leave my door unlocked and no one would enter it. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't do that anymore. Yeah. So, you know, and you got that feeling in this movie where. Well, it was definitely during that time, you know, when there was that age of innocence. Mm hmm. So you get that feel of it. And then you have this guy that presents himself as this trustworthy person, but. You do get this idea that he is kind of, he's got some screws loose because his eyes are very oh creepy. The guy that they casted for this movie was perfect for this role. I mean, he had that, those killer eyes. He had that wide stare killer eyes, you know, like thousand mile gaze. Mm -hmm. And he did it so well. You know, his features, you know, it was like innocent, but he knew something, you know, like he said, it was something loose. But, the, I mean, you never would have, and of course, you know, every, you know, I don't know if the guy really had a limp or not, but the thing is, is like, he also, he had a limp, you know, his leg, his, one of his legs was, didn't work, you know, so he was the perfect person for that role because everybody didn't expect him. To be the killer that he was till the mom walked in trying to hack up her daughter. Yeah, he had a machete over her about ready to 
hack into her, and the mother walked in. If she wasn't so dumb, he would have done it already. <laughs> yeah. So, at the end of the movie, I didn't know if you saw, uh, there was blood on the, st- on the Ishtar statue. Her eyes were bleeding. Yeah. So I didn't know if it was supposed to be like, she was crying because she was almost there. She was almost back to life or something. Overall, I give this a really high... I think it's a five. I think it's just a classic film. I think it's a great horror, classic horror film. That everybody who enjoys corny... Not even really corny. Enjoys, you know, horror films. This is a good one. I think it's a good one. I would highly recommend it. And especially since it's free. Um, well, a lot of the ones that we've done are on Tubby TV. You know... It's simple. All you got to do is go on there and register. They ask for, like, you have to create a password, and they ask for your email address, and that's it. They don't ask for any card information or anything. You just go on tubbytv.com and create an account. They ask for basic information. They don't ask for a card. Boom. Yeah, well, I think this... Y'all watch it for free. Well, I think we're wrapping this one up. It's hard to talk. Wait, how long is this? Like, 67 minutes? It is a little over an hour. Yeah, it's an hour and seven minutes long. Yeah, it's really hard to trying to drag out an hour podcast when the movie's an hour movie to some extent. But yeah, it's it's definitely a good one. Mm-hmm. I would recommend it. So this is again going to be one of our shorter podcasts, but. Stay tuned for more bloody, bloody, not so Valentine yes. movies. And we'll see you next time. Scare you later. Bye.